Hello. Welcome to Easter worship at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Lidditz. I'm glad we can be together this morning. We're going to be joining millions of people across the world who want to say, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Have you ever thought of the risen Christ as the gardener? That's what Mary of Magdala thought. This person standing near her must have been the gardener. But what if that is exactly whom the risen Christ is? The gardener of creation. Pastor Rob addresses this thought in his sermon this morning. Again, I'm glad we're together for Easter worship on this day. Soon our choir and bell choir will be presenting music for Easter morning.
Alleluia. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. If this is your first time with us, or maybe at a Lutheran church, we just kind of bring you by here that we're going to say, He is risen. Anytime you hear that throughout the worship service, the proper response is, He is risen risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. I'm Pastor Robin. Warm welcome. We join the Christians all over the world today in celebrating the glorious resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, children, people of all ages are welcome uh, to this service. Again, we also though have a playground as well as busy bags for kids out right behind. At this point, we continue our praise. us all to rise as you are able. We worship in the name in which we baptize, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us together confess our sins. Jesus, you died on the cross for us and for the world. We have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought, word, and deed. Jesus is risen. Sin and death have been defeated. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus, you showed us the way of compassion and truth. We have not followed you as we ought. Give us strength. Jesus is risen. Sin and death have been defeated. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus, you arose from the grave. We have too often lived in fear. Fill our hearts with joy. Jesus is risen. Sin and death have been defeated. Your sins are forgiven. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We join together in singing, Jesus Christ is risen today.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Son to suffer death on the cross for our redemption, and by his glorious resurrection, you delivered us from the power of death. Make us die every day to sin, that we may live with him forever in the joy of the resurrection through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and it is found on page 230 in the New Testament of your Pew Bible. A reading from 1 Corinthians. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read responsively Psalm 118, as it is found in your bulletin. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. The Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation.
I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This day. The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory Glory to you, Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. And she saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lined with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that Jesus must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and another at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but he did not, she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you had carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, that I, and I will take him away. Then Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, No longer hold me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. children to come forward as the congregation is seated for a children's message. Come on up, come on over, join me in this area here. I'm so glad to see so many of you on this beautiful Sunday morning. We have so much to celebrate today, and I have a surprise for you, so come on over. Find a good spot to sit. There's room for everybody. Good morning to you all. Today is a really special day. I know you know it. It's why you're here with these joyful faces. It's Easter, boys and girls. We're here to celebrate a big reason for being together. I have something to show you. Some of you will recognize this. For some of you, it's new. This is a clay jar, and it's a jar that we've been using for our preparation for this special day. And every week as we've been getting ready for Easter, we've reached inside and we've remembered a special Bible verse that we have a treasure in a clay jar. Well, today I'm going to reach inside and show you this beautiful image of a treasure. 
Today, the good news for us boys and girls in this word here spelled out treasured is that what Jesus did on the cross and what he did today by raising from the dead is a treasure. Jesus himself is our treasure. And Jesus did all this, boys and girls, dying and rising for you because you are a treasure. You are Jesus's treasure. And that's what we celebrate today, that Christ is ours and that we are his. Well, this type of treasure is such good news that it's not the hidden kind. It's not the buried treasure kind. This is the kind of treasure we want to share and tell others and make really clear all over the world that Jesus died and rose for us. So today I'm sending you on a treasure hunt. But it won't be too hard because, like I said, it's not hidden. There are people in the congregation right now that have this kind of image with them. And I invite them to hold it up really high so that you can see where the treasure is. When I tell you it's time, boys and girls, you can go and find one of those treasures. You can take it. There's a, there's a coloring crayon on the back of it for you. I even have more than what you see here so that we have enough for everybody. But before I send you out, boys and girls, to go get that treasure, you can take it home, color it, color it during the sermon, share it with someone, hang it someplace. You are treasured. Jesus is our treasure. And I say to you, Christ is risen. He is, he is risen indeed. Alleluia. Go find a treasure. Okay, the back of the third section's got a number of people. Okay. Harper, Harper, right over there. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Okay, I think... Let's say a prayer then. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So anybody get started with their spring planning yet? Anybody pot any pansies this year already? Anybody pick any weeds? How about mow the lawn? I know my allergies are telling me that many people are mowing the lawn. Right, so we got a lot of lawn going on. It's springtime, and we often associate spring with Easter with gardens, right? We often think about Easter and, and flowers and gardens together. We have the sanctuary so beautifully adorned, and I was walking yesterday, and in the church you could see the flowers up around the church, and we even have a, a cross of flowers. Again, we, we so often associate gardens and Easter. And part of that may simply uh, be the time of year, but, but really there's a, a deeper spiritual, a, a theological, a biblical connection between Easter and, and gardens. And what, what points us towards that today is that in the Gospel of John, where nothing is accidental, right? The writer John, every word he, he put in there, he chose for us to hear. And the writer John lets us know that, that one of the early disciples, Mary Magdalene, confuses Jesus for a gardener. Not just any gardener, the gardener. And that's because, well, what was Jesus doing? I, I actually think Jesus was actually just kind of picking deadheads and, and kind of bringing things to life there. But I say that not, not simply because, again, this is pretty in spring, but, but we look at the whole biblical story, okay? So you came to church today, we're going to get the whole Bible story, all in one here. Because in the beginning of the Bible, it starts out in a garden. And it's a beautiful garden, we call it the Garden of Eden. 
But what makes the Garden of Eden beautiful isn't simply the flowers or the animals that are there. What makes the Garden of Eden so beautiful is the relationships, the right relationships that exist in the garden. So, so in that original garden, the humans are, are trusting God. They're trusting God for all of their daily provision. And humans are actually getting along, right? The, in the garden, we have the first words of a man. You know what the first words of a man in the Bible are? This is my translation, okay? But the first words of a man in the Bible are, wow, Lord, my wife is beautiful. That's the first, really, really, you can look it up, Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter 2, that's the first words of a male in the Bible. Again, humans are, are getting along, and there's celebration and love for each other. And then there's also this relationship of humans to the whole garden. Humans are put in the garden, and then they're given this task to, to field and to grow and to name and to create. And, and God gives us permission to enjoy creation and to draw from it and be creative in it, to reflect God's image as we care for the garden, okay? That's the, that's the beginning. That's how it, it was. But unfortunately, it doesn't stay that way too long. You know the second words out of a man's mouth in the Bible? The woman you gave me made me do it, right? That's how... It, gets, it goes downhill pretty quickly in the garden. And life in the garden is a little bit tougher. Life in the garden doesn't quite work out. And, and humans, instead of calling on the Lord in prayer and trust, they become afraid of God. And they live lives of shame and blame before God and before one another. And even creation becomes something that fights against them. And really the rest of the biblical story before Jesus is, is all about this, this struggle between God, humans, humans and each other, and humans and all of creation. Again, the, the whole rest of the Bible, I just summarized a whole lot of those chapters for you, that it's all about the struggle of humans to God, humans with each other, and, and creation. But then Jesus comes, and and Jesus is doing all this great stuff, but things fall apart for Jesus as well. And, and when you know, where do things fall apart? Where does it really start to go bad for Jesus? In the garden. Because that's where he's praying. And he's praying, Lord, take this cup away from me, but not my will, but your will. And what happens in the garden? That his disciples fall asleep and Judas comes. And Judas, with a kiss, betrays him. Again, the, the undoing of humanity is in the garden. But then you see Jesus goes through all of this and then he comes back resurrected. And where else could he possibly have been resurrected? But in a garden. It had to be. It had to be. The, the creation began in a garden. The fall happened. The fall again happens to Jesus. And now Jesus comes back. But the story isn't even over yet. If we, if we were to read on and go to the end, the, the last book of the Bible, Revelation, which can be so confusing, have so many images that we don't understand. At the, at the very end, it becomes crystal clear there's a garden. Of course, that's how the Bible ends, once again in a garden, and it's, a, it's an echo, it's a recreation of the original garden, and there's the, the tree of life. And, and this time, the tree of life, out of its, its leaves come the healing of the nations. And finally, all these divisions and all of this <clears throat> war and strife is finally put to rest. And you see the people from all over the world, all across time, they're, they're praising now the living Lord. And the river of life is there, and it's making glad the city of God. And all of creation is again reunited. Again, the, the line between us and God has been restored. The line between us and each other is restored, and the circle is complete. All of creation is once again in communion. This is how it started, and this is how it will end. And this is the story of the Bible it's also, though, in many ways, the story of our lives. It is the story of our lives. As a wise pastor once told me, all of us have an original garden in us, a, a sense of, of beauty and longing to be part of creation. And whether that's simply that when we feel our hands in the dirt for the first time in the spring, 
or the weird way in which high schoolers and middle schoolers choose to plan plants for science experiments. Like, what could be more boring, right? Again, we're drawn, we're drawn to creation. And the way, again, in which when we, we see the sunrise or sunset, or we see the beauty of the flowers, and we're just drawn into it, and something inside of us begins to sing and resonate profoundly with that beauty. Again, we're, we're intended to be in creation, in communion with creation. And with each other, even the most introverted of all of us still hungers for relationship, still hungers to feel part of something bigger, still hungers to be a part of a community. And finally, there's this profound longing that we all have to be known, to know, and to be loved, and to love our Creator. You see, there's an imprint on, on all of us that, that the way that the garden was, this is, this is how we long for life to be. But we know that that's not our existence every day. We know that so, so often when it, it comes to our relationship with, with God, we're very much like, like Mary Magdalene here, where, where God's goodness is revealed. There's the empty tomb. The, the tomb is empty, and, and Mary's response is, they took Jesus. She can't even see the resurrection. And then even when Jesus is in front of her face, she's so overwhelmed by grief and sorrow and trauma and fear that she can't even recognize Jesus in front of her. Again, we know this estranged relationship with God that is so often with doubts and fears. We know, too, again, that our relationship with, with those around us often is, is out of whack and is broken, and finally, yes, indeed, with, with all of creation. And so, so we, we live with this original garden, but we know that the, the life that we're in doesn't always feel that way. But, but yet, somehow, we have this longing, this, this sense in us that somehow is greater than even the power of our cynicism to, to cling and, and to hope and to have this sense that, no, one day, all things will be restored. I think about when we're saying goodbye to, to a loved one, and they're dying, and, and we... The, we're overcome by so much, but we have this conviction that we can't let go of for some reason that, that somehow it's not actually goodbye, but it's until we see each other again. For we know that somehow in God's goodness, all of creation must be restored. This is where we are as humans caught up in this story. And when John then tells us that Jesus is mistaken for the gardener, when John lets us know that Jesus is at work in the garden and raised there, what John is telling us is that, that Jesus has come for something grand. Jesus has come for the redemption of all things. Maybe you've heard, well, you know, there's no plan B, earth is it. That, that may be true, but, but actually I believe there's a plan alpha and omega. There's a plan, Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ has, has come to redeem all things, restore all relationships, restore the broken circle and the communion of all things with our Creator. That's what Easter is about. That's what's going on. But, but what's also so powerful is that Jesus today is called the gardener and not the farmer. Okay? I got no problem with farmers, and I'll preach that sermon another day, but today we're preaching about gardeners. And the reason why is because farmers just have to, they've got to mass produce. They've got to feed hungry people. But a gardener, a gardener takes time and looks at every single plant, where they want to put it, you know, repots it, moves it around, has to make sure that this one has enough water, has enough fertilizer, starts removing the dead leaves from individual plants. Gardening is often about the individual plants. And that's what we see Jesus doing here. He, he touches down and he begins to care about individuals. Right? What's the, the first thing he's doing? After the resurrection, you would think, well, you know, Jesus, if your whole mission is, again, to renew all things, then, then you ought to be about the, the powerful. You ought to be about sending hordes of angels in. But, but instead, Jesus chooses to focus on this one person, on this one person who's actually a peasant, a peasant, but this peasant is his friend, and he loves her, and so he's going to tarry with her. And when he comes to her, out of compassion, he, he asks her questions, although he knows the answer. He says, why are you weeping? What are you looking for? Such tenderness. But it quickly dawns in him, this isn't enough. And so then he calls her by name, and he says, Mary. And when she hears her name, she snaps too, and she realizes it's Jesus right there before her. And she's overcome with joy. 
There's nothing more individual or personal than being called and addressed by name from a friend, indeed from our Lord. And so Jesus, this day, on this Easter, is calling you by name. This is what Jesus has done in the waters of baptism. He has called you by name and declared you to be the treasure, you to be the one for whom he has died and for whom he has risen. This is, again, we have this cosmic sense, but, but again, Jesus is the gardener who goes after each one of us, calls you, calls you by name. And so now I want to, though, connect this all. So on the one hand, we have this salvation of the whole world, right? We have a salvation of the whole world, but we also have the salvation of an individual, and I want to put those two together. And what that means is that your salvation, your salvation is part of the grand salvation of all things. Let me say that again. Jesus has come to renew all things, make the circle complete, renew all of creation. And Jesus has come one by one, one relationship at a time to redeem and save us. And that means that your <laughs> salvation is part of the grand story. You are destined for eternity your story has become God's story, has become the universe's story. And what, what that means is, is that this life has profound meaning for us. Be, because if, if Jesus, the first thing that, that Jesus does after he's been raised from the dead is he gets to work actually weeding earthly plants and talking to earthly people about relationships and confronting us and healing us in our grief, what this says is that this life, this world matters intensely for Jesus, that Jesus loved this world enough to come into it and to redeem it and to save it and to make all things new. And this means that we have this, this earthly task now of being gardeners. And I don't just mean the beauty of planting plants in the spring. But I mean, we have the, we have the, the task of, of once again reflecting God's image as one relationship at a time. We participate in reconciliation, be that of, of individuals or of tribes that are fighting one person at a time to rejoice and let them know that, that indeed our God is their God, that Jesus Christ has come to restore them. Again, everything we do now is, is poignant and pregnant with meaning because this world matters that much to God that he chose to send his son to redeem it. And so earth, yes, earth and all of creation is rejoicing. For Easter is not a day about escape, right? Easter is not the day we all found out there's a spaceship to take us out of here. Rather, it's the day when we, we celebrate that there was this, this seed, this seed of love that was sown in the grave. And, and the world thought that they had, had buried it, but instead they had just planted, planted the true seed of God's love. And, and on this Easter day, we see it breaking forth, and its, its power is such that it, it will never yield, and its love is such that it will finally be greater even than death, and it will not stop. Jesus Christ will not stop. The new creation will not stop until it has transformed every relationship and all of creation so that once again the garden has been restored and all of creation can sing Alleluia. Amen.
us profess together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Rejoicing in the risen life of Christ, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. We pray for the church. Unite all Christians in our shared calling to proclaim the gospel. Raise up women and men to serve as faithful leaders. Make us bold witnesses to the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the nations. Bring peace to communities torn apart by warfare. We lift before you the tragedy in Ukraine. Guide all refugees to safety. Bolster the courage of those who put themselves in danger to preserve the lives of others. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those in need. Shelter the homeless. Protect those who suffer abuse or neglect. Befriend the lonely. Give peace to the dying. Comfort the bereaved and heal the sick. We especially lift before you the names of our friends and family, either out loud or in the silence of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our congregation. Help us to be rooted in the good news of Easter, that we may grow in your love. Lord, in your mercy. With thanksgiving, we remember those who have died in faith and all who yearn for the fulfillment of your Easter promise of resurrection and life. Lord, in your mercy. Joining our voices with your faithful ones in every time and place, we offer our prayers in the name of the risen one, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Also with you. Here's a sign of God's peace. seated for a few brief announcements. Again, I invite us to be seated. Wow. First of all, a warm word of welcome to all those who are visiting uh, with us today. If you'd like a, a follow-up contact, there are blue visitor uh, slips, and you can put them in the offering plates on the way out. Also, a warm word of welcome to those worshiping with us for the first time today online. I thank so many people who have helped out by singing, by playing, by by adorning the sanctuary. So many ways in which we've had just countless volunteers in the last, uh, this holy week 
which I think really has been a beautiful opportunity for us to uh, walk with each other and walk with Christians all around the world and most importantly walk with, with Jesus. Um, there, there are, this week, things will slow down a little bit at the church, um, but if you'd like more details about what's going on, there's actually a QR code in the bulletin. You can uh, go to the weekly announcements there, and that, uh, there's a printout of that uh, by the prayer list in the narthex or lobby. But really, the, perhaps the biggest thing, though, this week is that you all have been so faithful in your giving that we're going to be able to move ahead with uh, the roof and solar panels. And uh, again, we're gonna, the stone has been rolled away, and now we're going to take the stone off our roof tomorrow and this week. So um, the pastor will be napping, and so will many others, but the roof uh, work will continue this week. So I thank you for your generosity towards that project and your faithfulness in your giving. And as we present our gifts, I invite us all to rise. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and after he had given thanks, he gave it to all, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we do this, we proclaim the great mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And in that great hope we pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The table is ready. You may be seated. I know we have a lot of visitors. So, the way Jesus the gardener. An amazing thought. Maybe for you an unusual thought. And yet... Jesus the gardener has been a truth extending through all of creation from the Garden of Eden to the tree of life at the end of history as we know it. God has been revealing the plan of right relationships, of reconciliation of humanity with God, of you and me with our neighbor and among nations. That is all part of the good news of Easter. Christ risen from the dead to make this reconciliation happen. May that be a truth you not only celebrate today, but live throughout your life. God bless you this Easter day. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. <laughs> 